मेरो नाम मेखलिम्बु भिजुअल आर्टिस्ट हामी चाहिँ पहिला म सानो हुँदा भनु न स्कुल जानु भन्दा अगाडि चाहिँ हामी हाम्रो समाजमा चाहिँ हाम्रो लिम्बु समुदाय भएकोले हामी लिम्बु भाषै बोल्थ्यौँ हाम्रो हजुर आमा हजुर बाउ काका काकी अरू रिलेटिभ्स र गाउँको अरू समाजको मान्छेहरूसँग चाहिँ हामी लिम्बु भाषामै कुरा गर्थ्यौँ हामीलाई नेपाली भाषा अरू भाषा आउँदैन थियो भन्दा हुन हामी चाहिँ सबै कुरा आफ्नै भाषा मार्फतै कम्युनिकेट हुन्थ्यो हाम्रो अनि बाजेहरूले पनि पहिलाको उहाँहरूको कहानीहरू भन्नुहुन्थ्यो इतिहासको कुराहरू उहाँहरूले भोग्नु भएको एक्सपिरियन्सहरू सुनाउनु हुन्थ्यो तर जब स्कुल सुरु भयो अनि हाम्रो बा नै त्यहाँ स्कुलमा टिचर हुनु भएर चाहिँ त्यो एक खालको त्यो भाषा नीति अब नेपाली भाषा खस नेपाली भाषा भनौँ न त्यो नीति अन्तर्गतको शिक्षा प्रणालीले गर्दाखेरि चाहिँ अरू भाषीलाई चाहिँ त्यो पढ्न गाह्रो हुने अनि त्यो गाह्रो हुने अनि अर्को त पढाइ राम्रो नहुने त्यो भएर चाहिँ बाले के भन्नुहुन्थ्यो भने तिमीहरू अब नेपाली बोल आफ्नो भाषा अब नबोल नेपाली भाषा चाहिँ बोल्न थालेपछि तिमीहरूको पढ्न सजिलो हुन्छ पछि जागिर खानु सजिलो हुन्छ अरू मान्छेहरूसँग बोल्नलाई पनि सजिलो हुन्छ भनेर त्यस्तो तरिकाले भन्नुहुन्थ्यो कि बा आफै पढ्नु भएको तर पढ्नु भएर पनि त्यस्तरी हामीलाई चाहिँ त्यस्तरी गाइड गर्नुहुन्थ्यो भनौँ न त्यो एक भाषा प्रणालीले चाहिँ एक हिसाबको प्रभाव चाहिँ त्यस्तो खालको थियो त्यो भएर चाहिँ अगाडिको जेनेरेसनले पनि हामीलाई चाहिँ त्यसरी चाहिँ ए एक खालको प्रोत्साहन अरू नेपाली भाषा बोल भन्ने खालको प्रोत्साहन गर्नुभयो कि कस्तो भने हाम्रो जब पृथ्वीनारायण शाहले एक हिसाबले एकीकरणको नाममा कोनोलाइज गऱ्यो त्यसपछि अब एक सय चार वर्ष राणाहरूले शासन गऱ्यो हिरङ्कुश शासन त्यसपछि त्यति त्यत्रो हुँदा पनि कति हाम्रो इतिहास अथवा संस्कृति अथवा कति कुराहरू हाम्रो जोगेर बसेको थियो नि त हाम्रो इन्डिजिनियसदेखि लिएर जति पनि राज्यबाट सीमान्द्रकृत भएको अथवा बहिष्कृत भएको भनौँ न पछाडि पारिएको त्यसको इतिहास चाहिँ यो पञ्चायत कालको यो तिस वर्ष शासनले चाहिँ एजुकेसन एक भाषा एक धर्म एक भेषको मार्फत यति धेरै त्यसले नष्ट गरेको अरू जाति अरू धर्म मान्नेलाई चाहिँ महेन्द्रले चाहिँ शिक्षा नीति मार्फत चाहिँ एक भाषा नीति मार्फत चाहिँ अब एउटै भाषा लागू गरेपछि त हाम्रो त बहु भाषिक बहु धार्मिक बहु जातीय राज्य हो त्यसमा त धेरै असर पर्ने भयो नि त अब धेरै अरू भाषी अरू जाति अरू धर्म मान्नेलाई त त्यसले त एकदमै त्यसमा पनि धेरै जस्तो हिन्दू धर्मबाट प्रेरित भएको स्टोरीहरू अब कविताहरू जीवनीहरू अनि शाह वंशको र राणा शासनको वंशावली पढाएर आफ्नो इतिहासबाट टढायो भनौँ न अरू जाति र अरू धर्म मान्नेहरूलाई अनि यो एउटा डाटा पनि छ होइन यो इन्डिजिनियसहरूले अथवा आदिवासीहरूले चाहिँ ठ टाइम टाइममा चाहिँ प्रतिरोध गरेको अथवा भाषा सम्बन्धी आन्दोलनहरू चलाएको अनि त्यस त्यस आन्दोलन चलाए बापत चाहिँ जेल परेको अथवा मृत्युदण्ड भोगेको The dissent against the Panchayati system is leadership and solidarity for the rights of indigenous people of Nepal, which he advocated until he was alive. He was well respected in our community, and his name would come up quite often and was regularly invited to speak. And by the way, I'm from Limbu community, from eastern Nepal, uh, <clears throat> also referred to as Limbuan. My name is Subhas Teve Limbu. Uh, I make artworks. Um, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I do not have knowledge about linguistics or anthropology. Everything I'm uh, saying in this talk would be from the perspective of my, uh, my or our collective experience growing up in an indigenous community. Um, can we switch off? Possibly turn the lights on? Thank you. Right, and my story of not knowing my mother tongue is not that different from uh, artist Mac Limbu's uh, experience. You see, my father and mother always spoke in Limbu among themselves, but never with us. They never encouraged us learning it. I will give you a small example of how this thought of speaking Nepali rather than mother tongue ingrained in our society. When I was a kid, I used to tag along with my mother while she visited government offices to procure some forms or register some stuffs in uh, municipalities or like village uh, ward offices and uh, so on. 
And I can clearly remember my hands clutching her fingers. Uh, my mother would ask some officials, and the officials who were mostly Khasaria background would ask for so and so papers, bring so and so, I mean, uh, received from so and so places, uh, or do so and so procedures. People like my mother and father would have simply no clue about what they were talking about. First, I mean, of course they spoke Nepalese, but their uh, fluency and their um, vocabulary is well, well below average. So even today, my father doesn't understand uh, what you call it, a proper Nepali uh, news on a television. I mean, those terms and words, I mean, of, you wouldn't understand it. I mean, but in simple Nepali terms, I mean, of course you would. So, yeah, and... And, and uh, they would ask to bring so-and-so papers and so-and-so uh, procedures. And uh, people uh, like my parents, my generations, uh, uh, my parents' generations, they wouldn't understand it because the officials would use bureaucratic languages. And of course, they wouldn't elaborate or explain it in simple Nepali. They would rather point to someone lurking in the courtyard or outside the office or say a middleman to seek help in exchange of under the fee table. Uh, under the table fee. This was and still is a regular custom. Even for a literate person, uh, I mean, uh, you can imagine uh, the frustration uh, and anger of uneducated people like my parents had to go through. The embarrassment and humiliation, the sense of being called a paje, topa, that's like a slang language for like, you know, hilly people, village people, I mean, unaccustomed to city life. Uh, I mean, uh, the sense of uh, being a moron just because of not being able to communicate effectively due to lack of uh, Nepali language competency was disturbing. The frustration and anger led them to dream of the days they would walk along with the educated and fluent Nepali-speaking children in those offices. They would, held, uh, they would held their head high and not seek help from corrupt staffs and middlemen. They dreamt of reclaiming their identity back by having educated children bustling side by side in those offices, who would understand every bit of those bureaucratic terminology and would be able to speak on the same level as those civil servants, argue and get things done. So this dream and determination of my parents' generation to make us educated, be able to compete and compare on every level in Nepalese-speaking society, and be able to get a job made them believe that it would be best to raise us not with our mother tongue, but only Nepali. And I'm sure the reason is the same for almost all people of my generation, from all indigenous committee who cannot speak their mother tongue. The anger and frustration was so severe, uh, unfortunately they didn't thought that someday we'd be asking questions, I mean now, I mean, uh, why didn't you uh, taught us mother tongue? I mean. Uh, I talk about these things with my father, and he says, oh, I mean, we should have, I'm sorry. I mean, poor dad, I mean, you know, <laughs> what can I say? But, and he admits, I mean, they should have taught us our mother tongue. But we all know it was the systematic heavy-handedness on establishing one language policy and ignoring the rest by the authority was the main cause. I, <clears throat> going back to a little bit of uh, the history of dissent in my community. Uh, while people stopped teaching their mother tongue to their children, there were dissenting voices against the system or status quo um, in my community as far back as 18th century. The most popular and early dissenting voice from my community came from Sirizanga Singh Thevilimbu, my great 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 grandfather. It was not in Nepal, but in Sikkim. Uh, I mean, mind you, there was no Nepal at that time. Uh, but there was Limbu, a group of like 10 Limbu kingdoms in the Himalayan region, um, now part of like Eastern Nepal, Northern Sikkim, and probably Western Bhutan. Uh, Siri Zanga, he traveled widely. He revived the Limbu script and started a movement to educate and make people literate in their own language. While in Sikkim, it is said that the ruling authorities who were Buddhist saw him as a threat, for Buddhism had their own agenda of expanding the religion and language. 
He was eventually murdered by the Tasong, Tasong monks, his body tied up on a tree, shot with poisonous arrows. Later, we had Iman Singh Chenjong, and fortunately, in our times, we had Padma Ranna Tuladar, Gore Badir Kapangi, and many more. I mean, before there was not much coherent accents because of the Panchayati rule where every kind of dissent uh, was um, crossed before it gained momentum. It was only after 90s, 90s uh, people's movement that uh, people started to talk about freely and organized movements. Uh, I still remember hearing first Limbu songs by Bhagat Subba in cassette tape right after or somewhere uh, in the people's movement uh, time. Uh, I imagine he was singing uh, those songs about revolution and preserving the Limbu culture uh, long before. But of course, I mean, it was not recorded or broadcasted anywhere. But after that, there was like significant number of publications, songs and films uh, and whatnot. I mean, right. So uh, why do this? Why resist? Why dissent? I mean, people say it's pointless to talk about the past. The matter has been addressed already. This digging of the past only encourages um, division, a communal tension in the society. They say uh, those era was different. It happened everywhere in the world. And yes, they're right. Uh, thanks to people like Padma Radna Tuladar, Gore Badar Khopangi, and many others who led the movement, the dissent has now more or less achieved some goals. All languages spoken in the country are treated as national languages by the constitutions. We even saw like parliamentary figures taking oath in their own mother tongue. And uh, they, they do give speeches in their own mother tongue as well. Um, there are provisions for ethnic languages to be taught in schools, but of course, implementation is the name of a rare animal in Nepal, uh, whereas impunities are mass produced like broiler chicken. Uh, it has been addressed in constitution, but now we have to focus the dissent to implement those promises. With regard, uh, regards to digging the past, I mean, to, see, uh, to say that researching, studying, talking about suppression and oppression of the past inside ethnic uh, and communal tension is absolutely baseless. History has shown us that human beings have very short memories. So in order to stop repeating the same mistakes again in the future, we must discuss, remember, and work for better conditions as much as we can. And on that note, may I take this opportunity to thank uh, Pasaputsa Guti UK, uh, Suas Nepali Society, and my dear friend Sangyak Tasresta. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Um, moreover, we must continue this talk, this dissent, follow its development and critically explore ways to do better. We must continue this dissent in the name of all indigenous people, Janjati, Adivasi, Madesi, Muslim, Dalit, who endured hardships and humiliations, who struggled and sacrificed for this cause. And yes, they are right when people say those times were different. It happened all over the world. Get over it. But that simply does not mean or make it right. I mean, uh, okay, let me make a sweeping statement. Uh, the reason behind, I think, I, I think the reason behind the dissent, the resistance, and movements regarding all indigenous languages share a common experience. An experience of marginalization, experience of oppression, and suppression by the colonizers and rulers. The language, their language and culture destroyed in their own homeland. And in process, creating unequal societies of haves and have nots. So in a way, we can argue that it's more about representation and equality than the language itself. I mean, one can't assume colonizers to be egalitarian or compassionate. And we all know it was wrong, it is wrong, and always will be wrong. And because of those wrongs, now there are unequal societies. And people are demanding equal representation, and rightly so. And language is a medium, a tool, and a good one to reclaim their rights and culture. And when we talk about the struggle of indigenous people, it does not mean anti-Brahmins or anti-Chetris or pseudo-political kind of rhetoric. I mean, uh, my God, I mean, the majority of uh, Brahmins and Chetris are poor and marginalized as, as well. Dor Bahadur Bista explored this narrative in his book, Fatalism and Development, Nepal's Struggle for Modernization in 1991. Um, it's not about hatred of certain caste and community when we speak about these struggles. It's not about seeking revenge or retaliation. 
It's about acknowledging and admitting the facts. Because unless we admit something was wrong, we possibly cannot move ahead and make things right. I think it's about who we are as human beings. It's about what stories and experiences our previous generations went through. Like I said earlier, it's about remembering the past and not to repeat the same mistakes again and again. It's about acknowledging the differences within us and embracing the diversity. Some say it's pointless. I mean, the number of languages spoken in Nepal, which is approximately 123, will see a severe decline in the near future anyway. I mean, there was also this a, a, a really interesting article uh, in Washington Post um, by Joan uh, McWhorter called What the World Will Speak in 2115. He says, quote, by 2115, it's possible that only about 600 languages will be left on the planet as opposed to today 6,000. Japanese will be fine, but languages spoken by smaller groups will have a hard time of it. Too often, colonization has led the disappearance of languages. Native speakers have been exterminated or punished for using their languages, end quote. I mean, his prediction might turn out right, though I'd like to believe uh, the opposite will be the case. I think it's very sad and negative line of thought. I mean, the sun will swallow the earth in like 7.5 billion years. I mean, eventually we're all gonna die. Uh, why bother to do anything at all? Um, you see, it's inevitable that the change is the only constant. And uh, for sure, uh, the languages will go through it and has been going through it and will go through it. I mean, um, it, it's been like this since time immemorial. It's only that challenges will never stop, but will only change shape and form. We have to keep on working and find new ways of dissent. So what could be the new ways of dissent? I mean, first I think we should, uh, such an emergent, like C said, I mean, we have to start from our own family, um, encouraging, uh, maybe, unlike my parents, um, sorry, father, uh, unlike my parents, maybe we should encourage kids to speak the mother tongue since early age, or encourage them to take language classes. Um, I mean, uh, we have to pressure the government to provide adequate budget to hire and train language teachers according to the needs of specific communities, specific areas. We have to focus on our archiving near extinct languages, languages uh, like from my community and Newar community. I mean, uh, they are quite in a safe category, but languages like Kusunda, Koche, Waling are near extinct and needs more attention. The other thing, um, I mean, uh, one of the most important thing would be like, we have to think about ways to make it uh, relative and relevant. I mean, it, if it's not, uh, uh, I mean, you can't relate to it, then it will have less chances to survive. And as an artist, uh, I think uh, it will widen the perspective of young speakers and learners if we can include languages in contemporary art and music. I know people like, Sanyukta, I, I think you have all seen his film, Sankhadar, uh, right? People like Sanyukta, Mek Limbu, who is doing some work as well in Nepal, and Juma Limbu, who is doing some Munda music. Uh, he was in London um, a year ago. And many others from different communities are incorporating their language and history in art and music. Art and music, uh, I think, are the bedrock of the culture. Though I do acknowledge the role of religion as well, but that would need like a totally different event to discuss. And the other thing would be assimilating technology. Arguably, um, anything that is not compatible or not incorporated with technology will eventually extinct in the future. And language is no different. If it cannot be produced digitally, I mean, its fate is like more or less sealed. So we have to find ways a uh, different uh, we have to come up with ideas to include it uh, with the technology. And literature, um, uh, publication text, um, like as Shashi was talking about, uh, uh, I mean, uh, publishing uh, text and the magazines in their own languages. I mean, that would be a great thing to keep on going uh, with that uh, kind of publishing. And, uh, and especially in literature, um, science fiction or speculative fiction. I think this genre is like one of the most uh, important kind of platform to imagine possible scenarios and future worlds and our roles in it. 
it's unfortunate, I mean, it's unfortunate that this genre is nowhere to be seen in our country, Nepal. Um, I hope people working in literature will hopefully contribute in this genre and aspire new generations of thinkers, creators, scientists, and who knows. I mean, uh, imagine a future where people speak their own language with another community, but still be totally understood with the help of, like, say, for example, bionic technology or something. I mean, imagine a future where you can switch to another language and feel the experience and the way of thinking that comes with it. Imagine a future where differences are not feared, but celebrated. The more we can imagine and speculate in detail, more likely it will be to actualize. Thank you very much. <laughs>